Romans uh, chapter 4, and just to kind of review, uh, last week we talked about kind of a lot, you know, um, in chapter 3, Paul makes the argument that there is no one good, uh, that no one actually seeks God on their own, um, and that our own righteousness cannot get us to heaven. I mean, we, we know that, um, that that's really an affront to human pride to say that, oh, there's no one good. And of course, you have a lot of people out there that we look at and we think, well, they've done good things, but we don't know their heart. We don't know their motives. But God knows everyone's heart. God knows everyone's motives. And so that that's the problem with us judging ourselves, with us judging others, is but God sees everything, and and really according to, and Paul is quoting the Old Testament here, uh, and he's saying no one is good, no one seeks God on their own. They seek what they want from God, not uh, or, or a blessing or something what can benefit them, but they're not seeking God to know God. Um, and then we talked about how our own righteousness cannot get us to heaven. You know, we can try and do all these works. So he, he talks about. Um, you know, just this works-based righteousness, which you've heard me talk a lot about. You've heard messages on this. But now what you're, what you're getting as you read through Romans, as we study through this, we're learning where it comes from, how it's put together. Because that's really important. A lot of people just go to church. They listen to what the pastor says. They kind of accumulate a t- teaching or doctrine for themselves based on what they've heard. But they never really go to see in the Bible, how it was all put together. And so my hope is that you guys will see how it's put together and hopefully make you even more confident where, hey, you know what, I could do a Bible, I could lead a study, or I could teach this to somebody else. And um, and so I, I, I hope to inspire you to do that. Um, and of course, he talks about we're, not, we're saved by faith, not by works. And <clears throat> and he's building up, and we're going to go through more of his, his argument in chapter 4, but y- you can see every, each chapter is building upon the previous chapter. This whole thing is kind of like, he, he's kind of like this legal mind. But again, the legal mind of somebody 2,000 years ago in Greek culture. So uh, let's go ahead and get into what he's talking about in chapter 4. He, he kind of turns the corner and he talks about Abraham as an illustration. He, and, and of course, the story of Abraham, he was called Abram, now he's called Abraham. And his story is in Genesis. Um, and what Paul says about him is that, and, and by the way, we're, I'm going to lo- use the New Living Translation. I'm using this a little bit more just because there are some parts. Uh, because of the way it's translated, the New Living Translation is called a dot for dot translation. So just um, on Bible translations, let me share a little bit about that. Um, the Bible is translated from the Greek language uh, for, uh, in the New Testament and the Hebrew and Aramaic language. Aramaic was what Jesus spoke. Okay, uh, The Hebrew and Aramaic language in the Old Testament. And there's two basic kinds of translations. There is a dot for dot translation where they take the whole sentence or the whole dot and then they will add words in the Eng- English words in there that aren't in the original language to make it flow so you can read it easier, you can speak it easier. Okay, well, I'll get what he's trying to say. Then there is the word for word translations uh, King James, the ESV the one that we use, uh, those are word for word. So each single word is translated, but sometimes it doesn't flow really well. It's an awkward sentence structure. So if you guys have a hard time sometimes with the ESV, that's why. They're being trying to be faithful. The translators are trying to be faithful to each and every word. Still, they have to add things in the English language that aren't there in the Greek, but they have to do that less. And then, of course, if you go all the way the other way, there's what's called a paraphrase, which really isn't a translation. A paraphrase basically is almost takes a whole paragraph at a time or a whole chapter and tries to put it in a modern language. And that's not really a Bible translation. Uh, it's good if, 
if you're really having a hard time, but there's such good translations out there, you shouldn't have to use a paraphrase. Paraphrases are like the message. If you hear pastors using the message, don't make that your study Bible. It's, it may or may not be accurate, kind of the way it's shared. Um, I don't particularly use the message. I don't like using paraphrases. Uh, I can paraphrase. So why do I need a paraphrase? Paraphrase is just pastor preaching. Right? I'm already doing the paraphrase. So I want a translation. I want something that a hundred people worked really hard day and night for years on and produced. <laughs> okay, that are experts in the language. That's what I want. And so I'm bringing those tools. I can paraphrase for you. So I, I wouldn't bother getting into a paraphrase. But anyways, uh, short of it, we're gonna, that's why we're in the NLT, New Living Translation. So let's go ahead and get into ver- chapter 4. He says, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Um, Oh, Whenever you see that, when you're reading your Bibles and you see capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D, does anybody know what's different from that and then just L and then the rest are lowercase letters? When you see in the Greek language, in the Greek language, in the New Testament, when you see all capital letters, that word Lord is Y-H-W-H are the letters, it's Yahweh, it's the name of God. And um, so, I think it's called the Tetragrammaton, but basically, <laughs> it, it, it's the actual personal name of God, Yahweh. We aren't really sure how it's actually pronounced. People pronounce it different ways, but Yahweh is the way I pronounce it. If you just see the regular capital, it's the regular Lord, capital L, all the rest of us, lowercase, that's Adonai. Adonai is just the master of the house, or your boss, or somebody who's higher up, somebody that's in charge. But whenever the translators capitalize all that, that's the word Yahweh. Completely different word than the personal name of God. Just so you guys know, when you're when you're reading your translations, that's that's a tool that you can use. So what's he saying here? He's saying Abraham's faith was counted or credited to him as righteousness. By God. What does it mean credited? Um, there's a Greek word here, uh, logizomai, or lo, it's how it's pronounced, logizomai. <laughs> but it is to take an inventory or to estimate. Uh, there's a number of uh, translations, but basically this is an accounting term to credit, basically, to um, to credit to one's account. So think about it in this way. If you have a bank account, right, and all of a sudden somebody's deposited money in your account, praise God, you know, but it's not, you haven't earned it, you don't know where it came from, it's like, bam, it's, it's yours, free and clear. It's not something that you worked for, it's not your wages, you didn't earn it. It's a gift, it's just been given to you, okay? So, that's that that's that same word that's that's used here and what it means is that god saw abraham's faith and it wasn't abraham's faith that saved him our faith does not save us it's not my personal faith that saves us otherwise my faith does not work it's having faith in god and what he's done for me so it's, it's where I place my trust. And so he saw Abraham's faith, and he said, you know what? 
I consider that righteousness. I am depositing righteousness into your spiritual bank account. And so you are now righteous. Oh, but, you know, Abraham kind of messed up, right? I mean, he, he wasn't sinless even after he was declared righteous, but God credited it to his account. And so uh, I want to familiarize you with the term. That's a theological term we call it imputed righteousness or righteousness righteousness that's not from you it's god has given it to you god has credited it to you he has seen your faith in him and he has declared you righteous not according to how you act or how how good you follow the the rules or how obedient you are to him but he has declared you righteous because you have put your trust in him and, and so that's why, you know, we're considered justified. So it's the same thing as when we talk about justified, that means we're cleared of all guilt, right? And when we're justified, we're forever justified. It's not, okay, you're justified, no, you're not, no. You're declared guilt, not guilty forever. Or some have termed it, uh, theologians will call it positional salvation. That is your position. So... Th- this, this term, imputed righteousness, if you hear it, if you read it, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about just like Abraham, just like when he met Abraham, and Abraham trusted in him, had faith in him, and, and, and gave him the righteousness, that same thing is available to us, that same righteousness of God. Because it's not our own righteousness, it's not self-righteousness, it's the righteousness of God given to us, credited to us. It's a gift. So, when we take a look at a lot of these, uh, I'm going I'm to throw up some statements. First of all, um, let me pull up my notes here. I want to take a look at Okay, saving faith. When I when I say the the term saving faith, uh, what what comes to your mind? It just and here's the other thing too, as I forgot to mention this. I mean, I, I think everybody is is fine with asking questions, but if you really don't want to ask in front of everybody, you can always text me <laughs> the question. <laughs> but I encourage you to go ahead and ask it out loud. You know, nobody's making fun of you. There's no bad questions. There's no dumb questions. Uh, we're all trying to learn, but um, how would you describe saving faith? If I say, well, what what is saving faith? I and mean, think about like what we've talked about so far these past several weeks, just in your own words. Okay. Put another way, what is when I talk when I, if I say I am saved by grace through faith, is there another way of saying it besides what Jacob just said? <laughs> <laughs> just again, I'm not looking for a right exact answer, just from your heart. What's it? I'm sorry? Okay. Belief. And what's belief? Okay, trust. Good. Any other words? Belief, trust. Yeah? Trust. What object am I placing my trust in? Right? Right, exactly. Good. So I have belief, right? That's good. And you know what James says about belief, right? Well, we'll get into that. But but it's, like it's not just belief, but it's belief, but it's trust, right? Trust in God. So we're th- 
And, and, and this is kind of what Paul is doing. He's building this argument. You see what I'm saying? He's, you guys are putting out words, and these are all right. But he's building an argument because what happens, we just throw out a word faith or belief, or we, 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 we just say one of these words. Sometimes people get confused, and it's easy to get confused because let, let's face it, Paul's writing is not the most easy to understand. Because he's taking this time to develop this argument. But uh, guys like Martin Luther got a hold of this, and it set their world on fire. Because they were so burdened, and they got God was so mean and everything. And then when they saw, they discovered what justification is. And, 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 and that God credited righteousness to us. It changed their whole world. It changed the church. It made them want to translate the Bible into thousands of languages. I mean, it really affected history, and it, it affected people's relationship with God. And so, I, I think that um, so when we're looking at this, we're looking back and going, "Okay, well, justification, redemption, propitiation—these are all big words. What does all this mean? Well, and why is it important? Well, I think when we understand it in our own words or in our own hearts." That's what I wanted to sink in. It's not that you memorize the, the theological phrases or terms, but that you get the gist of it in your heart. Because when you get the gist of it in your heart, that's what sets you on fire. When you hit the aha moment, and you think, oh my gosh, I need to tell more people about this. So let's take a look at, at some things. These are... You, you tell me, what do you, th what do you think might be wrong with the, these statements? Because when, when I ask this question to other people, or if you ask this question, people will come up with different phrases. Uh, here's, here's three. I am saved because I've tried my best to be a good Christian. B, because I believe in God and try to do His will. Or C, because I believe in God with all my heart. So... What about this first one? Because I've tried my best to be a good Christian. What would be mm, incorrect with that? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I, yeah. There's that personal pronoun. Is that a pronoun? <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, because I have tried my best <laughs> to, to be, so, <laughs> so I've tried my best to be a good Christian, yeah, so, so this is, is basically works, okay, so it's being saved by your works, and we've just learned that, no, that's, that's not how it works. What about B? Because I believe in God and try and do His will. What what would be what's kind of off about that? Try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. be, try, try, and try to do His will. So, what's different about this one? This is than the first one. So it's works. Right, so it's it's like, but it still works. So it's now it's faith plus works. So the first one just works. This one is faith plus works. But you see, a lot of people say this, right? Even a lot of people go to church. Even people that go to Bible teaching churches, because maybe they don't absorb everything, and they're thinking, no, it's still I've got to work my way. Like, wait a minute. So we can, we can know a lot, but do we get it into our heart? So here, and what about the third one? Because I believe in God with all my heart. That sounds pretty good, right? Well, because I believe in God with all my heart. Okay, cool. So, so what's the reason I'm saved? Yes. Right. So... It's because I believe in God with all my heart. What does James say? 
Even the demons believe and shudder. Ooh. And, he, and he's not talking against Paul. But it's believing in God just means that you're intelligent. Intelligent people are going to go, oh yeah, something put all this here. That's kind of obvious. My heart is like, okay, I believe with all my heart. But it's, again, it's believing in what he has done for us. It's trust. It's faith. Right? So this basically, so you have works, you have faith plus works, and then there's belief, but there's not necessarily trust in here. So, or it's faith as a work. So this would be the best way of explaining this. Is this is kind of tricky because it's faith as a work. Well, all they got to do is just believe. This is the person that goes to church. Is that what you want to do? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And they pray. Oh, I prayed that prayer. Well, are you getting closer to God? No, I prayed the prayer. But um, are you? What are you doing to get discipled? What's that? I prayed the prayer. Up until there was no such thing as an altar call or making the decision for Christ until D.L. Moody started doing this at his tent meetings. For 1,800 and so many years, basically it was like coming to Christ was like repent of your sins and be baptized. Basically turn, turning to him. It was a heart thing. It was just a decision people made. But it wasn't like... It, the, the, the language of making a decision for Christ. That's not even actually in the Bible. What does it say? It says repent. It means to change your thinking, change your mind, to turn to Him. So you turn your mind, you turn your heart over to God, you trust Him with your life, right? So basically the downfall of all these beliefs is what 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 this creates if if i if i'm a or if i'm b or if i'm c what's happening in my christian walk is i have fear i have anxiety when i fail i beat myself up there's a sense of despair i'm not good enough or hey maybe i'm doing really good you know i do my best to be a good christian oh i feel really prideful uh, they're not doing so good. I'm doing so good until you're not doing good, and pride comes before a fall. Doom, 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 doom. Right? Um, and so we 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 end up in a dark place. We end up in a bad place. We don't end up living in the love of God. We don't end up with His peace. We don't end up um, living out that Christian walk that we've always heard about, because. We get, we, and that's the danger of false beliefs. That's the danger of bad theology and works-based theology in the prosperity doctrine and all these teachings out there that basically are work your way to heaven. And, people, and then you have people in the pews or in the chairs or whatever just being so discouraged, right? Or you have stuff the other way where it's just all, they don't hear the word at all and it's all just encouragement. And God's all, and, and the teacher's like, just live your best life now. Right? It's not based on truth. Just live your best life now. Or if you're doing this, you know, God will bless. Or your blessing is just around the corner. Don't give up. And, and all this stuff. It's like, but it's not out of the Bible. It's like usually out of the big book uh, from AA. Or it's from uh, a lot of these guys. They just rip stuff off from other speakers or other motivational book, but it's not biblical. But there's, remember what he said in chapter one. He said the gospel is the power of salvation for those who believe. If you want to have power as a believer in Christ, we need to hang on to this. Salvation is through faith in Christ alone, through his work on the cross. Amen.
It was Jesus and nothing else, right? And and we believe in the Bible is the Word of God and nothing else. So basically, he gets down. To, so so verses one through eight really is kind of. Going over that again, I mean, reiterating what he's talked about in chapter 3. And then he's going to get into talking about um, uh, circumcision again. Here we go. And this is kind of a long, long one. But let's go ahead and look. It's from verse 9. It says, so he's talking about Abraham as the father of all of us. You know what? Uh, Abraham is our spiritual father, not just of the Jews, but of all the nations, or of all of those who know Christ. And this is where that teaching comes from. So in verse 9, he says, now is, this blessing, now is this blessing only for the Jews? Or is it also for the uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. But how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised, or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. And of course, circumcision, it says, was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. And you and I, we're, we're like, what is the deal with the circumcision? What does that have to do with anything? And, but back then... It was important. It was a sign of separation that God had chosen uh, the, that tribe. He had chosen the Jewish people, and that's how he decided that they be marked externally. Uh, but we've also read how that represents a cutting away of the evil in our hearts, right? Because he also talks about circumcision of the heart. But the point that he's making here is that it, just as Abraham had faith and was credited, as right, credited to him as righteousness, so, you know, we have that same faith. I mean, he's basically, he said he would be the father of many nations, and it's not just, he's not just talking physically, he's talking Abraham is the father of many nations spiritually. Um, but... The Jews, you know, they want to brag. They want to say, especially the Jews or Jewish Christians, oh, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're the chosen ones. But we know that, and you're going to see this when we get into chapter 9, you, they still have to go through Jesus. It's not Jews do not have a separate plan of salvation from the Gentiles. We're the Gentiles. We, we all are saved the same way through the faith, the same faith that Abraham had. So he says, so Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. So that's you and I. So Abraham is our spiritual father. Okay. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, the Jews, but only if they have the same kind of faith that Abraham had before he was circumcised. So clearly God's promise is to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants, it was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. Now, I mean, Abraham lived before the law. The law didn't come until Moses, right? So Abraham was around 500 years before the, the law was even written. And God calls him... He steps out in faith. He believes that God has called him. God speaks to him and he says, you know, just as, a, you know, you can't number the stars. It's like, you, or even the sands on the seashore. You're, you're, you're going to be the father of our many nations. And sometimes we miss that because we think about, well, Abraham is the father of the Jews. And we also know that uh, he's the father of Ishmael. Now, Ishmael is where we get the Arab nations from. So we always see the Jews and the Arabs fighting back and forth. That's been going on for millennia. <laughs> um, and, and so, and, and in fact, uh, it was foretold that 
you know, uh, they said, Ishmael's going to be a donkey of a man. <laughs> so it said. Uh, but from those tribes, I mean, there's just that, that constant warring, right? The sibling rivalry. But they're physically, yes. So this is why even uh, Muslims, which is a completely different religion, but a lot of the Arabs, uh, they, they see Abraham as their father as well. So not only the Jews, but also the, many of the Arabs. But you and I also look at Abraham, but we look at him as our spiritual father. And why is this necessary? Why, why, why is this important? Because he had faith before anything was written down, before there were Ten Commandments, before there was anything like that. He's the one that had faith in God. Tithing, he's the first one that did that. So he did all these acts of faith. I mean, think about it. If you were called out into to leave your family, you know, you hear this voice. <laughs> You're going, okay, this is God. God's telling me to pick up everything, leave my family, and just start going. Right? Sell somewhere, wherever he tells me to sell. That's a lot of faith. And, and, and so he's using that as an illustration, saying, hey, it's, it's not according to the law, it's not according to follow the law, it's not according to circumcision, not according to any of that stuff. Let's go all the way back to Abraham and how Abraham just had this pure faith in God. That's how you and I got to be. That makes sense? So that's why he's saying this stuff. That's why he's making this argument. Because remember, his audience, he's talking to a lot of Jewish believers that are still kind of, some of them still kind of stuck you know, and figuring, okay, well, how am I faithful to the law? But I'm also a Christian. Like, guys, stop. <laughs> Let's go back to Abraham, right? Forget about Moses for a minute. What does he say? 14, if God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary, and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking law is to have no law to break. So the promise is received by faith, it is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham, for Abraham is the father of all who believe, that is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations, that's in Genesis uh, 15. 16, or 15, 16. This happened because Abraham believed in God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. And it's kind of interesting he said, that Abraham <coughs> believed in God who brings the dead back to life. It says in Hebrews that, you know, when he was going to, remember when he, God told him to offer his son, his one and only son, offer your son Isaac right on the altar. And and he was just about to do it, and then God provides the sacrifice. And we know that that's a type, that's a foreshadowing of what Jesus would eventually do, right? In Hebrews, because a lot of us, <laughs> I don't know about you, a lot of people, you know, we think, uh, okay, wait a minute, why would God ask me to do something like that? Well, the clue is in here, but also in the book of Hebrews. He says, Abraham believed that God could raise his son from the dead. That's why he did it. He had so much faith that he believed, even if he sacrificed, God would raise his son right back up because God fulfills his promises, because God promised he'd be the father of many nations, which could not happen if the promised son was sacrificed and did not rise from the dead. He had faith that God would do that. It's the same faith that you and I have that God's one and only son was sacrificed for our sins, but that he rises from the dead. So, <clears throat> and he brings the dead back to life. Who creates new things out of nothing? And the, also, this also talks about Abraham, super old. His wife's old, barren. She's not going to have kids. She's grandma. It's like snowball. I mean, she's, she's past the age, right? That's why 
He had her sleep with Hagar, and they had Ishmael. But God does the amazing thing, and then even in her old age, she has Isaac. Verse 18. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good, or dead, good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. <coughs> Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus as our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right. Uh, that should be right with God. Um, I got cut off there. Let's take a... Well, first, any questions? I guess that Abraham but, um, Well, he was a father, he'd be, because he was bringing the, he's the spiritual father. So he's bringing the gospel message. He's bringing the message of salvation through faith, right? So that salvation through faith was in the Old Testament, not just the new. And a lot of people don't realize that. We have the full revelation of Jesus, but we have the Jews giving the message out to the Gentile nations. I mean, the whole book of Jonah is about preaching the gospel to the Ninevites, the Assyrians. And the Assyrians, the capital of Assyria, and they were brutal, horrible, terrible, wicked people, and they repented, and they turned to God. So we have Gentiles getting saved from the Jews, telling them about their God. Right? We have that in the Old Testament. Like we haven't even gotten to the Messiah yet, but say they're all looking forward to the Messiah. Hebrews 11 says this. They're all looking forward. They knew what was coming, and so they put their hope in the one that was coming, and they're preaching that gospel to everybody. So Abraham is a spiritual father of, basi he's a spiritual father of many nations. That is um, the spiritual influence. So Noah basically, that was just repopulate the earth. Right, but it wasn't you know go forth and you know be fruitful and multiply. But there was no commission from Noah was faithful. That's how the human race was saved, right? Just through those eight people. But uh, we don't see that he's commissioned like Abraham is. See, th this is the other thing too is under Noah, and this goes into a little bit of. Uh, Michael Heiser's teaching and stuff on what, on what happened. See, there were three rebellions uh, in the scripture, not just one. We, we know of one, right? We know that Adam and Eve sinned, but they, they rebelled against God. But we also know in Genesis 6 there was a second rebellion, and that was basically the angels in heaven rebelled against God, right? Came to earth. It said that they were with women, and th there's... I don't even get into all the YouTube stuff, but but basically, there there was a there was that second rebellion, it's a Genesis six rebellion, when when uh, the sons of God, the Elohim, basically, but the Elohim were a particular hierarchy of angels. They rebelled against God, came to Earth, and cohabitated with human beings. And then Noah, basically, it was so wicked at that time, it got so bad, their influence was so bad on the earth, and that's why God flooded the earth and wiped it out. It wasn't just people acting bad. It was that there was that undue evil angelic influence 
upon the population, and they were wiped out. And Noah was saved through that, his family. But even after that time, there was a third rebellion, and that's in Genesis 11. So you have three rebellions, Genesis 3, Genesis 6, and Genesis 11. Almost six chapters apart each, right? Genesis 11, they begin to build the Tower of Babel, right? And the tower, and so we're going to reach the heaven. Was, again, rebellion against God. They're probably thinking, hey, you know, we're, we're going to worship, you know, some of the angels, and we're going to worship this and that, and everything except the one who created them, right? And then God says what? He, it scatters their languages. Now, I don't have time to go into all this teaching, but it's in, it's in Psalms, it's in um, Deuteronomy, I believe Deuteronomy 32, but basically what it says is when they rebelled, you know, God had assigned, God has angels watching over us, right? But some of those that had fallen says, oh, you, you want to you wanna follow these, these guys? I divorce you. I divorce myself. So God divorces himself from the nations. Says, I'm going to start my own nation. And that's where Abraham comes from. He speaks to Abraham. He says, I'm done with all the nations of the earth because they were rebelling against me. They're trying to build this tower. They, you want to worship those false gods? Those are fallen angels. They're not gods. You want to follow them? Go for it. So, but I'm going to start my own nation, and then we're going to spread that light to the whole world. And that's why he chose Abraham. And that's why Abraham was separate, and that's why Abraham was considered, that's why when you, when you look about, um, when you hear about all the language in the Bible, where it, it says that Jesus will inherit the nations, God will inherit, he will inherit, right? Remember, God divorced himself but from all the nations, but he's going to reconcile. He's going to bring all the nations back together, and they're all going to be under Christ. right? But he started with one nation. He started with the, the Jews, but his promise to Abraham was, no, but we're going to take them all back. All those that rebelled against us in Genesis 11, we're going to take them all and more. We're going to take all the nations there. We're going to take them all back and then the final day, I'll put them all under my son. He will rule with an iron rod. That is a rule that cannot be broken. So I know that's what I'm going to throw out a lot there. There's, there's a whole bunch, a whole study on that. But if you want to know the reason why Abraham's the father of faith, that's why. Because God chose him and separated him out from all the tribes that had descended from Noah that rebelled against God in Genesis 11. So, and if you want, I can probably send you some links on that if you want to look into that. But there are three rebellions. Genesis 3, Genesis 6, and Genesis 11. So, it wasn't just once. God's patient, isn't he? <laughs> so, uh, let's take a short break, and then we'll come back and we'll hit um, the second part. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and uh, make our way back, and we're going to get into part two. So, you know, so Paul has made his argument in chapter four, I mean, chapters one, through four. Now, as he gets into chapter five, um, he's going to start telling us, well, what are the benefits of all this? So he's telling us, you know, God's, he talked about God's wrath, setting it up, like, why is God's wrath displayed? You know, there's no one good, not even one, no one looks for him, no one seeks God out, 
all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Then he goes into but look what Abraham did, and that's how we ha- have that salvation through faith. And now he's coming into chapter five, where he's going to be talking about um, well, what are the benefits of being justified or saved by faith. And so uh, we're just going to look at the first 12 verses. And he says this. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials where we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead us to disappoint, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might be, perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us while, by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because of our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. And actually, it start, it's not 12, but it starts at, ends at verse 11. So let's look at these things. So here are the benefits. First of all, we have peace with God, which is really good because whether you know it or not, before we, had, before we were saved by faith, before we were justified, we were God's enemy. Everybody's God's enemy, right? Why? Well, consider if you, you, you have two nations and they're warring be, because each nation thinks they have the right over a particular piece of land, right, to rule over that. We think we have the right to rule over us and this world. God created us and this world. And so these two forces are in conflict. And guess who wins? God wins. So guess who's at war with God? We, the human race, are at war with God. However, because of what he has done and because of our faith in him and what he has done, we are now at peace with God. So having this is not the peace of God that passes all understanding, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That, that's available. That's not what he's talking about. This is positional. This is, I am no longer at war with you. And that's good. Right? So God is no longer at war with us. We have a peace covenant with him. We have a friendship with him. The second thing is that we have access to God. And in, 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 in the ESV it says, in his grace in which we now stand, uh, another way of putting it is, we can access the throne room of God. And wherever we're at, whatever time it is, because it's in the Spirit, we can go before Him in prayer. So not only do we have peace with God, we have access to God, right? Before we didn't have the access to God, before there, we'd have to go through a priest, we'd have to go through sacrifices, right? We couldn't just approach God. In fact, in, on the Day of Atonement, they would send a priest in, they would have bells that were tied on to him, there would be a rope and there would be bells uh, and, and I think they're tied around his waist and he would go in. Uh, that was because like if he did not cleanse himself and he didn't do everything right and he went in, he dropped dead, they'd have to use the rope to pull him back out. So, <laughs> you know, you didn't just go into the Holy of Holies, you didn't get to just access God. But now we have this access when Jesus died on the cross the curtain was in the temple was torn in two. And that signifies that we can now enter into the throne room of God, which is what the Holy of Holies re- represented. If you want to know everything about the temple and how that's a reflection of what's in heaven, you can read Hebrews. The book of Hebrews talks all about that. So we have access to God. 
And then, of course, we have the hope of eternal salvation. You know, we're going to share in his glory. That's where we're, we're going to be with him forever. Uh, and many of you guys have heard multiple sermons on that. You know, we can, ha- we can rejoice even in our suffering. Not rejoice because of our suffering, but <laughs> we rejoice in our suffering. That's when we're in the midst of it because we know that we're going to get through this. We know that God's not having us go through this for no, no reason. We know eventually we're going to be with him. And while we're on earth, there's a reason that we're going through whatever we're going through, even though we don't know it at the moment. We don't understand everything. Oh, and I see that. <laughs> so, let me, let's go back there. Back up a little bit. Nope, that's too far. There we go. That's a really good verse. Verse 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. And I think that that's probably one of my favorite verses. Um, and really, it's because that, you know, we talked about it on Sunday that God's no respecter of persons, right? He doesn't show favoritism or anything like that. But his, his grace is incredible. Because not only did the cross go into the past and obliterate all the sins of the past, it went into the future. And when Jesus prayed in John 17, this priestly prayer, he prayed for his disciples and he prayed for all, for all of us. It's for all those who will follow me, right? He prayed for us that will follow him. So when he died, he had us in mind that he would die for us, even knowing the sin that we would do, even knowing the lives that we would live before we knew him, all the stuff, it didn't matter. He would do it anyways. And so what does that say about God? That says that he loves us. He has an incredible plan for us. That we are here because he has pursued us all the way. And the same one who pursued us and who saved us will get us to where we're going to, where we're going to be with him forever. So we don't need to worry. We don't need to fret. We don't need to be anxious. Because no matter what we see going on in the world around us, we know that we're going from point A to point B. We don't know how rough it's going to be getting there. But we know that we're going to get through it because he is in charge. We're following him. Um, And I, I think that that's really the comfort I draw from this. And it says even here, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Uh, It actually says ungodly or wicked in other translations or we were still wicked still un- uh, that God died for the wicked the ungodly which is what we were right and, and, and I, I think that we gotta not forget that that we're sinners saved by grace and so and then he says what in verse 10, our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son. So we're friends of God. We sing that song. I'm a friend of God, right? Well, that's where this comes from. That's where that song comes from is right here. We are, he calls us friends. And Jesus said that, right? To his disciples. So we're going to kind of leave it right there. And I just want to pause and I know a lot of this is kind of straightforward, but do you guys have any questions on this? Now I'm using the New Living Translation. No, I got it. So basically, just to reiterate, we have peace with God. We have access to God. 
and we have that hope to hold on to. There's a lot of people that don't have any hope right now. Or they're putting all their hope in the elections. Or they're putting all their hope in, in some charismatic person they're following. Or they're putting all their hope in their own ingenuity. Or they're placing their hope in something else, but not in Christ. But we place our hope in Him. And so hopefully we're a little more even-footed. Hopefully we're not shaken too much. You know, I don't know what the next several months is going to produce in this country, let alone the world. We are hurtling towards communism, which uh, Russia threatened to take us over um, after World War II, and they said they were going to do it through communism, basically. Um, and I think we kind of fell asleep at the wheel on that one. Uh, because there, there are a lot of uh, it's it's in our media, it's in our schools, it's in um, a lot of our institutions. Uh, they've written, written our the history book Howard Zinn's uh, History of America. But it's, I forget what the exact name of this book is, but basically, the history books uh, from the 1980s on up have painted. Uh, he was a communist. And so he painted a very negative picture of American history. And so, so this has been just kind of a gradual thing, and it's really, really ramped up the past 16 years, you know. Um, well, basically, since Obama came in, he really kind of <laughs> accelerated a lot of this. And so we have a conflict right now. We have these... Wait a minute, we're, we're based on Christian values and the Constitution and all this, and then we have, no, you know, the government should take over everything. Nobody should own private property, price controls, all that kind of stuff. And even even some Democrats, even some people are starting to wake up and go, oh my gosh. I don't know if you noticed a bunch of Democrats jumping ship and joining Trump. RFK, first Kennedy ever to break from the Democratic Party, just broke from him. Uh, broke from them, said, no, there's, he's so scared of Harris, and uh, he jumped ship. Tulsi, Elon Musk, all these guys are, and, and I think other Democrats are going to start jumping ship. Why? Because they don't want to be of the Communist Party, right? And that's what's coming down. And communism was um, started by Karl Marx in, to go against Christianity, basically to wipe out Christianity. So it's the opposite of everything we believe. So that's why you see so much stuff in the news. That's why I see so much fighting. That's why you see so many of these videos out trying to call attention to this. Because we go that direction. I, have you guys observed what's going on in Venezuela or anything like that? I mean, if you look in the news, uh, people are starving. They're eating their pets. That's, that's, that's an economy that's gone south. That's communism. And so when I see how close we're getting, I'm like, Lord, please save us. I, I'm, I pray that God does not allow us to go into that because if we go into that, um, I think <laughs> the time of the Antichrist is probably going to follow not too far after that. But... I don't mean to paint a dark picture, but I think you and I got to realize that God's, whoever gets in, whoever's allowed to get in, is because God allowed them to get in there. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't do the work. We can't just sit back. Yes, we should pray, but we should, can't sit back and like do nothing. Of course, they don't never count Hawaii in the national vote anyway. But. Um, we need to pray. We need to really pray for our country. We really need to pray. Um, no God's in control, but we, we, we need to pray and we need to let people know, hey, this is what's really going on. The enemy's really trying to take over America. And uh, Mm. Well, 
Yeah, and I, I've heard of that. I, I've heard that, you know, and you'll, you, you hear a lot of people that study Revelations and stuff talk about that. But keep in mind that the, the Bible was written mostly to in the Middle Eastern countries when it set the world. The countries, it was only, it was written and distributed really, uh, I mean, they weren't even thinking about this landmass over here. You know what I mean? Uh, like China is not mentioned in the Bible either, so <laughs> so we got to be kind of careful that I know that uh, some conjecture that's out there and it's a good question, but just because we're not in the Bible doesn't mean we don't have a part to play. Hopefully, we're not on the wrong side. You know, uh, some have thought, well, we must w- maybe we're the island nations or whatever because those are mentioned. But but again, when the scriptures were written, uh, they were mostly there. You look at all the nations that they're addressing; it's all out of that Mesopotamian area. So you got to look for Mesopotamia and go on out from there. You go to Egypt and all that area. And they're not mentioning the North American landmass. They don't mention South America. They don't mention Nicaragua. So you got to begin to think in those terms, like, okay, we're not mentioned, but so are a lot of other places, because they weren't countries, right? This this is a well, these prophecies are written almost 3,000 years ago. That's a long time ago. Isaiah, that's like, it's about three, almost 3,000 years. So. Oh, oh yeah. What, what yeah. They're, they're watching us, and, and we got a big responsibility. I mean, I think God's entrusted um, a lot of us, because we, we, we still have the freedoms that a lot of people desire and want, and we're seeing those... Uh, there's no free speech in the UK. There's no free speech even up in Canada. You know, you, uh, the Western nations were one of the, you know, there's there's some that there's just no free speech. You know, and, and so, and we're really getting that close to losing uh, First Amendment. You know, and when they, I guarantee you, like David Tim Walsh, he said, oh, you know what, you can, <laughs> we're done. We're 